The top three most watched shows on Netflix are The Office, Friends, and Grey's Anatomy. Streaming services like Netflix may have swooped in and changed the way we watch TV forever, but they haven't changed what we watch. Even though Netflix spends $8 billion a year on original content, they still haven't found their friends. Then I've already seen this one. <laughs> Although they came close with Stranger Things, that show just doesn't have the same reach. Friends is still everywhere. Aside from being the second most popular show on Netflix, it's also still being aired on TV. The oh, uh, wow, this is really, really flattering. The basketball player Kyrie Irving released a Friends version of his signature shoe to go with the Friends tattoo on his forearm. Even the cafe I'm sitting in while writing this is playing the episode, The One on the Last Night, with the sound off. But you may have noticed that even though they're still massively popular, these types of shows don't get made anymore. Why is that? During this so-called golden age, when TV and streaming services are full of shows that are more serious and highbrow than most movies. Depression. Whoa. What the f*** do you know about depression? Not the most popular shows are still these dinky old sitcoms that honestly look a little out of date. I know. Well, it's complicated. It won't be easy, but today I'm gonna try my very best to answer that question, and some others that will pop up along the way. It's a surprisingly complicated question, and there's no one right answer. But there are a lot of different things working together to make TV the way it is. We're gonna address them one by one, and try and get a better picture of why shows like Friends and The Office are so beloved, but also why they don't have any contemporary competitors. Nostalgia is a powerful feeling. It's easy to look back on the past and remember it fondly, maybe even more fondly than you should. And that makes sense, because the present can feel stressful and overwhelming, and the future is, by definition, uncertain. In Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. Looking back on the past is comforting. It already happened, so it doesn't feel uncertain. It's no secret that nostalgia is such a powerful feeling, and for that reason, it's often co-opted by politicians who want to make large groups of people do very bad things. It's also weaponized by TV writers, who want to make large groups of people sit on their couch and watch a show. That's why shows like Friends are so comforting to watch. While the fact that they aired in the past may be a part of their good old days appeal, it's not all of it. Many of the millions of people who watch it today weren't even alive when the show premiered. And back when it first came out, it was new. There was nothing to be nostalgic about. What's so interesting about a show like Friends is that watching it creates a feeling of nostalgia. Whether or not you've lived through a similar situation to Chandler, Rachel, Joey, Ross, Monica, and Phoebe, it feels like you're looking back fondly on your 20s when you watch the show. It doesn't even matter if you've lived through your 20s yet. The genius of a show like Friends is that it creates that nostalgia for you. Watching it feels like you're just hanging out with your friends. There are lots of other shows that create a similar feeling, and The Office is one that a lot of people have an especially intimate relationship with. Here's a good example of just how important that show is to some. John Krasinski, who's better known as Jim from The Office, although maybe not anymore, but he was for a while, appeared on a radio show called Q. And the host wasn't planning on telling him this, but he couldn't help sharing this story with him. I, sat I watched The Office while I sat there and said, this must be what being depressed feels like. Wow. But this is okay. And like wow. that's just, it was like two or three days. Oh, man. Watching The Office, or Friends, is an easy way to feel comforted. And according to some, it might even be good for your health. One psychologist even claims that, quote, when people are stressed or anxious or feeling out of control, nostalgia helps calm them down. It's comforting. It's analogous to a hug from your mom or dad or being cuddled. That's because, she says, it's hearkening back to what we might even erroneously perceive as a simpler time in our life with fewer responsibilities and obligations and fewer worries. And Netflix knows this too. That's why they spent $100 million to keep the rights to friends even for just one year. But if that sounds like a lot, it's not. Last year, Netflix spent $8 billion producing original content. Wow. The price that Netflix paid for Friends is 1 18th of their total budget for original content. On a pie chart of Netflix's budget, Friends would be an almost invisible sliver. But that sliver brought them their second most streamed show. Netflix users have watched a collective 32.6 billion minutes of Friends. Billion minutes. Let's take a historical detour. You may have heard people throwing around the terms single camera and multi camera. The difference between these two ways of filming TV is important to understand why there isn't a new show that can compete with the monopoly that The Office and the Friends hold over so many of our hearts and minds. So what are they? Single camera shows are the ones that look like movies. The ones that seem like they're shot on a single camera, even if in practice they aren't. If the two characters are talking, the show will often cut back and forth between them as they deliver their lines, or the camera could even move around. 
creating a more cinematic feel. The single camera setup also allows for more location changes, like in Game of Thrones, where the show cuts across a whole fictional world in seconds. As you've probably guessed by now, a multi-camera show is filmed with multiple cameras. They're also shot on a constructed set with usually three cameras ready to capture the action that unfolds in the same way that it might in a play. Most of the time, these shows are punctuated with laugh tracks or even live scored by the laughs of real people in a studio audience. A perfect example of this kind of show is Friends, which pretty much perfected the multicam formula. What's that? Well, it's rum and... Okay. <laughs> The main draw of this approach, from the network's perspective, is how cheap it is. When you have a single camera show, the options for what you can do burst wide open. But all these options cost money. The more locations you shoot at, the more the show will cost. You've got to pay drivers to get all the stuff there, rent spaces to shoot in, and pay for permits when you're filming on the street. These costs add up. When you start to have more camera angles, more lighting setups, and more takes, everything takes longer. And it takes more people to do, so more money. But a multi-camera show is filmed in one place. Usually it's an indoor show, where all the sets are custom made and the cameras are set up right in front of them. Like on a news broadcast. The actors go on stage and act out an episode as if it were a play. Unlike a play, if they mess up, they get the second chance. The multicam setup is so much cheaper because there are less moving parts, but also because it's so much less time consuming. Filming a whole 20 minute episode of Friends usually took only five hours. That's not even a full nine to five workday. Filming 24 episodes of TV would only take them three weeks, and that's if they only did one episode a day. In the era of Friends, most shows were multicam sitcoms because the risk was so low. If you made one and it flopped, it wouldn't actually be out that much money. Well, I mean, it's still a decent amount of money, the actors, and, but it's not a crazy amount of money. It's your money. <laughs> but if you struck gold and made a show like Friends, Seinfeld, or Frasier, you wouldn't be laughing your way to the bank just one time. You'd be going back every week to cash in all the syndication checks and eventually those hundred million Netflix bucks. Unfortunately though, this easy money came with downsides. The main one was that people found it hard to take television seriously. It was considered the ugly duckling of entertainment. It wasn't as serious or cinematic as capital F film. That's why you hear people sounding so shocked about the so-called golden age of TV that we've apparently been in for the past 15 years. Ever since The Sopranos premiered in 1999, paving the way for other highbrow cinematic shows like The Wire, Mad Men, and Breaking Bad, TV has been more like movies. These shows are full of complex anti-heroes and narratives that dive deep into subjects that are, well, deep. Masculinity, structural inequality, racism, you get the picture. But is it really fair to say that this has marked a before and after in the progression of TV? That making shows more cinematic and serious has made TV better? Is it true that TV used to be an inferior form of artistic expression, but in the past 15 years it's finally come into its own? Kinda. The shift from lowbrow laugh track world of the multicam sitcom towards the golden age is most definitely a shift. But is it for the better? Being more serious and more cinematic doesn't mean a show is more meaningful and more valuable than its campier counterparts. Take All in the Family. It's pretty much the definition of the cheesy, laugh-tracked, multicam show, but it most definitely does not shy away from some very touchy, very nuanced subjects. The show revolves around Archie Bunker, who is, to put it lightly, change-averse. He says things like this. Thomas Seddy. He's an Italian, which we all know what they are. <laughs> But the show is about him in the context of his family and the world. The whole point is that he's a bigot. His family and a lot of people who move into his neighborhood challenge his misconceptions. And the show is supposed to be about watching this progress unfold. Even so, it's a good thing that the job of challenging racist misconceptions is in other people's hands now. The point is that these old multicam shows were simple in their presentation because they had to play it safe. But that doesn't mean they couldn't be smart and profound in that simplicity. Like Seinfeld with its razor-sharp observational comedy. And you know what you do at dinner? What? You talk about your day. <laughs> but because of the way these shows were packaged, they were all somehow seen as less good than TV. Emily Nussbaum, who is probably the most famous TV critic in the world, said something interesting about this. When she was an aspiring young critic, reading what all the bigwigs had to say about TV, she noticed something. Quote, the main way of praising television was saying that it wasn't like television. If you needed to be convinced of this point, just look at how HBO used to advertise their highbrow content. Now, while all these millions of people were watching and enjoying lowbrow TV, they were constantly being told that it's no good, that they should be watching movies or HBO instead. Not only is that confusing, it's also offensive to all these people and their tastes. So the people fought back. Lovers of bad TV everywhere began to gather on the internet to discuss all the shows that were supposed to be bad, and later the good ones too. The main website where this took place had a fitting name, 
Television Without Pity. It was founded in the 90s by Sarah D. Bunting and Tara Ariano. They started with the idea of ripping apart Dawson's Creek with the hope of making it better. They were passionate hate watchers. But over the next few years, it morphed into something bigger than just Dawson's Creek Television Without Pity. The site became famous for its very sarcastic, but also very thorough recaps. The site's writers would watch the latest episode of a show and recap it minutely in thousands of words. Sometimes the recaps would take longer to read than it would to just watch the show, but that wasn't the point. Television Without Pity was a place for people to gather and look at TV on their own terms. As Margaret Lyons of Vulture put it, what TWOP did is insist that television criticism could be both arch and informed. That you could watch a lot of Roswell, you could care about Roswell, and you could still think Roswell is dumb garbage. What has really changed TV, though, is the way that it's distributed. When TV happened live, in the era of Friends and Seinfeld, shows had to be simple in certain ways. You had one chance to watch them as they aired, unless you taped them, of course. So things had to be pretty clear after one viewing. They couldn't be perceived as boring, confusing, or upsetting in any way, really. But with the invention of cable, then DVRs, and now streaming services, TV shows were slowly granted the permission to become more ambitious. Shows didn't have to play it safe in the same way anymore, because the audience was now interacting with them very differently. Emily Nussbaum, the critic from before, said that suddenly TV, which before had been something that would just extrude into your living room like cookie dough and then just disappear, suddenly it was a text you could save, rewind, and share with people. It basically meant that you could make shows that had a certain kind of visual beauty or density that needed to be decoded, revisited. You couldn't do that before. Since the Golden Age, with its cinematic, cinematography, complex narratives, and social commentary, TV has become more expensive. Streaming services, just like the networks before them, don't want to take expensive risks. That's why they pour most of their money into the shows that fit the present-day formula of successful TV. Back in the day, networks invested in the multicam sitcom because it was pretty much guaranteed a return on their investment. Now, glossy, polished shows are what people know and expect, and it's easier to watch them casually because of the new culture of binging. Yes, I'm sure. No matter how serious they are. You can just throw on a show and settle in for a long time. It's not all that different from spending an evening watching NBC's must-see TV on a Thursday night in the 90s, where you could catch Seinfeld, Friends, and Frasier depending on the year. Not only that, but streaming platforms have licensed more than enough old sitcoms to be just fine without their own new, original titles in the genre. Oh, it'll be heaven. <laughs> but what about The Office? This show is a little more complicated because it doesn't really fit into the categories that shows like Friends or The Sopranos do. It's not a multicam sitcom with a laugh track, but it's also not serious, cinematic, or sad. Its time on air also coincided almost directly with the transition into the Golden Age. The Office hits a rare sweet spot between the two poles of TV, and the proof is in the pudding. But you are not Jim. This is Jim! It's the number one most viewed show on all of Netflix by watch time. 52.1 billion minutes. For some context, that's 20 billion more minutes than Friends. It combines the dumb garbage of reality TV, and I put dumb garbage in quotes. Think of the pretty dramas and fourth wall breaking interviews with some very good writing about some complicated issues. And it's even got that nostalgic hanging out with Friends feeling that Friends has. How does The Office pull it off? First of all, it's just a great show. It's one of those right place, right time situations that happens once in a blue moon. But aside from that, the secret could be in the form. The Office is structured as a mockumentary, where a fake documentary films what should be the most boring subject for a TV show, a dead-end office, and the people who work there. But it's also a familiar setting. And the mockumentary style allows for an intimate viewing experience. It feels like you're right there with everyone, while they bumble through another boring day. It's comforting, but it departs enough from the tried-and-true multicam sitcom to make it feel fresh and unique. There are other shows that do this too. Modern Family, a huge hit. Parks and Rec, another huge hit. And Arrested Development, which may not have been the biggest commercial success when it first came out, but it eventually got popular enough that Netflix rebooted it. The mockumentary sitcom just reskins the classic multicam sitcom for a new generation. But it keeps that intimate, nostalgic family and friends feel. So what's next? We probably won't be seeing new multicam sitcoms like Friends anytime soon, and The Office's game-changing mockumentary style has also kind of gone out of style. So what can replace it? It's far from a sure bet, and they've still only lured in a pale shadow of the viewership that TV can get on a regular basis, but watching people live stream games and listening to podcasts are kind of just like Friends, watching people hanging out.
Anyways, what does the future hold for Nostalgic TV? Gaze into your crystal balls and let us know in the comments below. When you're done there, make sure to subscribe to Behind the Screen, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.